Russia is an interesting country because I think the parallels to America are actually pretty strong in that you have Europe and you have th three frontiers, three big frontiers to European civilization. You have North America, you have Latin America, and you have Russia. And each of these end up becoming vastly different stories, starting from roughly comparable subcomponents, where you see both democracy and slavery, which are the natural endpoints of frontiers in North America, in South America, and in Russia. And the irony, though, is that the end point was very different, where North America became a Republican democracy uh, based around uh, universal freedoms, and they, we abolished slavery. Latin America became a caste society based around small oppressive elites. Um, and Russia became an autocratic uh, big government society that turned basically everyone into a slave. And it's interesting to see these multiple threads inside European history where Russia, America, South America, they're all different little bits of Europe. Because if you looked back to Europe 500 years ago, you could see autocracy, you could see democracy, you could see capitalism, you could see a nobility, you could see a caste system. And so colonies often take a, the colonies are anthropologically the furthest extension of their home countries. So if you look at anthropology, America is more English culturally than England is. Uh, Latin America is more Spanish culturally than Spain is. And so Russia uh, pushed a lot of it. Frontier societies are very extreme. And so we're going to see that with Russia. And Russia is they're one of America's top rivals now. It's not unimaginable that we're going to have a war with Russia in the near future. And in our parents' time, Russia was that the great country that we feared. We were terrified of the Russians smashing into Western Europe, killing hundreds of millions or billions of people. And so Russia is a very important country to understand. And Russia has one of the more comprehensible histories. Russian history is pretty easy to explain compared to uh, China or India or Brazil or whatever. Modern Russia is fundamentally a creation of the Mongols in that Russia beforehand, and Russia was first established by the Vikings. And if you folks want to know more, watch the Vikings video, where the Vikings were trading in uh, the Middle East and Turkey with the Byzantines. And so the river system between Scandinavia and the uh, Islamic and Byzantine world was Russian. And so the rush the 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 vikings the varangians is what they were called the vikings established this uh state where they conquered the local slavic population and gradually intermarried with them so there's very little viking germanic influence in russia now but the vikings established russia as a country and they converted to greek orthodox christianity and that was not a preordained uh choice in that they had a chance that they would have converted to Western Catholic Christianity, Islam, the peoples of uh, modern, the area around Stalingrad and South Russia, they were Jews called the Khazars. So there was a chance that they would convert to Judaism. There was a chance they converted to Islam, but they chose to convert to, uh, to Oriental Christianity because their biggest trade uh, partner was the Byzantine Empire. And you can't understate the Byzantine influence on Russia, where keep in mind, this is a hyper Christian society. And so Christianity permeated every single element of life. And something like 70 percent of the priests in medieval Russia or 70 percent of the top church officials in medieval Russia were ethnic Greeks. And so the Greeks had a lot of cultural influence on Russia. And if you want to know more, watch uh, the video I made on Orthodox civilization. And, and that permeated very deeply. And Russia's in the middle of the map. And my Russian civilization video is very good, although it wasn't very popular. So you folks should watch that. I, the show more so, my main show is, uh, is anthro more anthropology. These videos are more so history. And, um, and 
Russia, after its Viking dynasty, collapsed into warring states. And this is the boring period of Russian history, where it's the state of Vladimir and Suzdal and Kiev and uh, Novgorod. And so Russia was these squabbling principalities. And Russia and Ukraine at this point were the same country called uh, Rus. And this is a huge political uh talking point today. And the, Putin says that the conquest of Ukraine is good because the Russians and the Ukrainians were originally the same people. And thus, it's their natural destiny to reunify. And then what happened here is that this actually, this is this is great. It moves right into explaining things. But um, but what was happening is that the eastern half of Russia was conquered by the Mongols, or sorry, the eastern half of the Rus was conquered by the Mongols, and the western half was conquered by Poland. And those are very different, where the Mongols are probably the most brutal conquerors in history, where the Mongols killed 100 million people when the whole world's population was 500 million people. And for a frame of reference, the of the top five mass killers, except for Hitler, they're all either Mongols or communist. And Mongols and communists killed roughly equal amounts of people. But keep in mind, when the commies were killing people, the world's population was 3 billion. Uh, again, medieval Europe, it was 500 million people. So the death the Mongols have is pretty astounding. And uh, they do have positive traits, though. They were incredibly intelligent. They created an era of peace on top of... There was a Mongol peace, an era of prosperity, on top of the literal piles of skulls they made. And of the entire Mongol Empire, Russia was the place that was treated the worst, where uh, the Mongols would just periodically enslave villages, and uh, they treated the Russians like cattle. Uh, that's not uh that's not a freudian slip they literally the mongols were herder peoples so their entire system was based upon animals and so the mongols literally did see the conquered peoples as like sheep or cows and they like in the same way you can kill a sheep whenever you want you can kill a farmer whenever you want farmers aren't real people um and so that was that was their attitude and the uh and so russia built up a tremendous amount of ptsd and PTSD is the common thread of Russian history, whereas someone who's quite familiar with PTSD, like every single part of the Russian character is edged with PTSD, where Russia's, I was talking to my dad and I said, I was one of the best history of Russia is Orlando Figgs's history of Russia. I was surprised how good that, that is because national histories tend to be mixed bags, where if it's a history of a country, it's either really boring or really good. Eastern Europeans tend to be they, 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 Eastern European national histories tend to be really good, though, because those countries are very nationalistic, so they care about making good narrative. When I was telling my dad, I stayed up late reading this book because it was so good, and he said, were you reading the history of Russia? Did you keep reading until you found something fun happen? Because Russian history is just endless brutality, and it's depressing as hell, where you get the Mongols, then you get the ensurfment of the, of the population, you get the Polish invasion, you get the... Uh, Swedish invasion. Uh, I, let's not get into spoilers. You guys will hear about this stuff anyway. Um, so, yeah, the Mongols treated Russia absolutely brutally. They burned all the major cities down. They wiped out its intellectual class. And there was an important change that happened here because Russia before the Mongols, there was a pretty good chance it ended up like America, where at that time, Russian peasants were free. And for a frame of reference, in France or England or that stuff, in that time period, their peasants weren't free. So in the Middle Ages, Russia was a freer society than Western Europe was. And, and, um, and also, whenever Western European visitors went to Russia, they said the Russians are very optimistic, they're entrepreneurial, they're intelligent. It's like, it seemed like a good place. That was the vibe check from Western European tourists in medieval Russia. And... Um, on top of that, Russia had democracies. There, so keep in mind, medieval Europe had almost every country in medieval Europe had a parliament. And that's something we've written out of the histories. Uh, and medieval people legally, uh, a lot of them, it depends on your social class. If you're a serf, things aren't so good. But for a lot of medieval people, uh, they had more legal freedoms than we do today. 
Um, among, it, it depends how you measure it. it. It skews among certain things and not others. Um, but Russia was like Novgorod. North Russia was this very wealthy city state called Novgorod. It's near modern St. Petersburg. And Novgorod was a, it was a republic. It was run by the merchant class. Russia had property rights. So Russia before the Mongols, it could have ended up like America. And when you see Poland, Poland was a country at that time period. And Poland was the biggest country in Europe. It had Poland, Belarus, uh, Ukraine. Poland had the largest voting franchise of any country in the world. 12% of Polish males could vote. And uh, in Britain, the other most democratic country, only 3% of British males could vote. So Poland was incredibly democratic, but it kept 80% of its population in basically slavery, that being serfdom, which we'll get to later. And, um, and so Mongols took eastern half of Russia, and the Poles took the western part of Rus. And so Ukraine and Belarus became separate ethnicities because the, they were colonized by the Poles when Poland, Poland, and it's weird, in this time period, Poland and Sweden and the Netherlands, all the countries people don't blink twice at now, they, they were legitimate world superpowers. Uh, same thing as Turkey. Um, well, Russia or Germany, they were really weak in that time period. So the Poles were incredibly arrogant, and the, the Poles are a great example for what to avoid in that they really blew their 200 years of fame. The Poles made a bunch of very bad calculations that alienated uh, like the Ukrainians and the Belarusians and that stuff. And over uh, Russian history, there's this big debate over whether or not Ukrainians are ethnic Russians. And the Russians call Ukraine Little Russia, and that's the attitude they had for centuries. And Ukraine's been a Russian colony for centuries. Um, the way that I see things is that it's as if the Confederacy gained independence and the Confederacy was an independent country uh, where, you know, the, the genetic differences between British Americans from the northern states and the southern states is comparable to different European countries. So and the South has its own history that goes back to Jamestown and George Washington and Virginia. And so the South conceivably could make a pretty good claim that they were an independent country. And they had their own culture and they're their own people. But Northerners would totally say, no, you're American. Yet, no, you broke off. You're American. You're going to get back here. And so that's the Russian versus the Ukrainian attitude. And um, and the Russians built their governance system off the Mongols because the Mongols did something good to Russia, which is the Mongols crushed all of the warring principalities. And Moscow rose from complete obscurity. Moscow is on the frontier of old Russia and frontier societies always do best. If you want to look at who wins the game, it's the country on the frontier that can expand against other uh, non-urban societies. Uh, so that's why Britain won. That's why Russia won. That's why America won. That's why the Qin dynasty won. That's why Persia won. It's always the best strategy. Expand against tribal groups, build up vast empire over tribal land, turn back into the civilized world and conquer it. And so Moscow was able to unify Russia because under the Mongols, the Mongols had picked Moscow as the country that collected taxes for them. And because Moscow collected taxes, it had the ability to coerce the uh, other Russian states. And that, and, and so on top of that, Russian governance is based off Mongol standards, where the Russian autocracy, where Russia was the most autocratic country in the world in the early modern period, that came from the Mongol precedent, where in Russia, the nobility, if you were part of the nobility, you were a government appointment. This is a huge difference between Russia and uh, Western Europe, where in Western Europe, the nobility are native to that territory. They've lived in that town for five generations. All their power comes from their local land. In Russia, you're a political appointment. You show up and your nobility is contingent upon working for the government, either in the bureaucracy or the military. So what this did in Russia is that Russia lacked any opposing social groups to the government, where the Russian church was completely uh, controlled by the Russian monarchy. The military was completely controlled. There was no independent nobility. There was no independent merchant class. Russia is an example of like an entire society that's just big government. 
And so the nobility, when they would pin letters to the, the nobility, when they pin letters to the czar would call themselves your humble slave. And that's the kind of culture they had. And in Russia, they would draft men for the army. And in Russian society, there's this ideal that you just serve your Lord. That's your place. You don't have a life. Your place is to serve your Lord. And so they would draft peasants for their whole lives without consent. And then to be more humane, they shortened that to 25 years. And that's the kind of society Russia was. And so that's from the Mongol precedent, where in the Mongol society, you had complete obedience to the Khan. And the Khan is the Mongol ter term for emperor. The Russian emperor is called the Tsar. And a lot of the Russian nobility were of partial Mongol ancestry. And when we're talking about the Mongols, the people of that time period called them Tatars. And uh, because the Mongols, like other great empires, through the process of expanding, the ethnic term for what's a Mongol changes, where, uh, where Mongols are out by China, and then they, through the process of conquering across all Asia, because the Mongol Empire went from Korea to uh, Romania, it's the largest empire in history besides the British. And it's the largest single contiguous empire ever. Um, they were using Turkic peoples to conquer out to Russia. So by the time you're out in Russia, the Mongol Empire was mostly Turks. It was like 90% Turkic speakers. And the Mongols had created this ethnic homogeneity across Eurasia by bringing all these peoples together. So I'm going to call them the Mongols going forward Tatars. And the Tatar, the Russians frequently call it the Tatar yoke, uh, like you know, the way you yoke a cow. It's the continued metaphor of the Mongols seeing farmers as sheep. The, yeah, so they, the Russians call it the Tatar yoke. And over the centuries, and Russia was the last place that the uh, Mongol Empire survived in. The Mongol Empire went on in Russia for another 150 years after they la lost power in Persia and China. And so around 14, in the year 1480, the Russians declared independence against the Mongols and fought them off. And through declaring independence, Moscow, or Muscovy as it's called, they declared themselves the third Rome because first Rome is Rome. Second Rome is Constantinople, who we spoke about in the last podcast. Third Rome is Russia. And the way European history works is that everyone LARPs as Rome. Uh, the Spanish were LARPing as Rome. The French were LARPing as Rome. The British were the uh, Holy Roman Empire was, the Turks were, uh, and Russians were, they were also LARPing as Rome. And so their logic was that, um, Byzant so Rome fell, Byzantium fell to the Turks. And because Russia was the only place in the world that was free, that had Orthodox Christianity and was free, the Russians saw themselves as God's chosen nation. And the thing to understand about Russia at this time period is it's such a driven society. And this is something I have immense admiration for the Russians. The Russians, they just had the will to do it, where they, uh, everyone loved Russia. The Russian peasants were treated like garbage, but they barely rebelled because they loved the country so much. Everyone worked for the government because they had this shared idea that you served this broader goal, that being Mother Russia. And the thing that motivated people the most was the church where if you asked a Russian person of that era, why do you fight for Mother Russia? They would say, because Orthodox Christianity is true and we have to protect the church. And so the church and the state were symbiotic in Russia. Well, in Western Europe, they, uh, they fought against each other. And in Western Europe, the divide between church and state, between the Pope and the Kings, this created intellectual curiosity because when you are too leaders were fighting each other, it means they had to develop arguments to counter the other. But in Russia, church and state are buddies. So you can't, you cannot develop rational, independent thought. And so Russia was st stunted in its uh, intellectual development until pretty long into this time period. It was stunted in its economics. It was stunted in its technology. Russia was a medieval society. People, Western Europeans who went to Russia said, these people are 500 years less advanced than us. And, and so Russia fought off the Tatars and it, it's, 
One of the things we forget is that Russia was established on the same time scale as America, where 1492 was, uh, I think Russia declared itself the, uh, it declared itself the third Rome in 1491. That's within a year of Columbus discovering the new world. In uh, the area around modern Ukraine, that was populated by uh, Tatars, and that was the, the, um ethnic slavic white russians they only populated modern ukraine in the 1780s for a frame of reference that was a that's a century after my home city of philadelphia was formed so america and russia are happening at the same time and we view all european countries as old but that's not particularly true and the the biggest story at this point is the Tatars just continue to rape Russia because Russia gains independence, but they have two Tatar governments that surrounds them. You have the Khanate of Crimea and uh, you have Kazan. And the Khanate of Crimea was a vassal state of the Ottoman Turks. And for both of them, they would raid into Russia and uh, steal the Russians as slaves to sell them in the markets of the Middle East. Because keep in mind, the Islamic slave trade is the biggest slave trade in world history. And um, the, the, the people of that region of the world, the Muslim world, they preferred Russians to fight for them as personal slaves, as sex slaves. And so it was just constantly people be, being enslaved and sold down to the Muslim world and this is a really, really huge thing where over half a million people were enslaved. And Russia had a population of 5 million people. So that's a really big percentage of the total population. And that pr produced this real uh, horror in Russia that it, it's like people were enslaved. And Russia had a population of 5 million people. So that's a really big percentage of the total population. And that pr produced this real uh, horror in Russia that it, it's like you're living next to a, a, a natural park for tigers where the tigers periodically eat your village. And so when you're living next to tigers, you have to get pretty tough to fight off the tigers. And the Russian fight against the Tatars was pretty heroic in that the, the Russians actually built a great wall. And this is the thing no one remembers. But, you know, the Great Wall of China, there used to be a Great Wall of Russia, where the Russians had 200 miles of fortification on their border with the Tatars. And the constant fight with the Tatars is a long thread over Russian history, and they gradually gain the upper hand over time. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Uh, no, just trying to follow the story. Let's, let's, uh, let's keep going. Okay, sounds good. Um, so... Russia was blessed with a handful of very good leaders that saved it. And if Russia hadn't had these leaders, it would be Brazil. Where Brazil is a big country, it has lots of resources, but Brazil hasn't reached its potential in any way. And Russia is stuck halfway between an America and a Brazil. That's a really bad way of phrasing it and that they're very different socially. But Russia has always had a small corrupt elite that monopolizes authority and they've also had a uh a strong government and brazil doesn't have a strong government and so russia everything in russia is, gov is state coercion and that thread starts with ivan the terrible and there was this poll that uh russian news put out uh like 20 years ago and it's asking russians for their favorite leaders of their history and the top result was stalin so Russians' favorite leaders, Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, all of these killed millions of people. And so you go through the, the greatest leaders in Russian history, they're all mass murderers. Um, and that's a, it's a real mixed heritage. Um, Russia as a country has got to spend a lot of years in therapy. Um, but Ivan the Terrible, he was like mega mega big government where his thing is i want to destroy the traditional nobility called the streltsy and then make the government incorporate everything and ivan the terrible was living at the same time as uh queen elizabeth of england this is late 16th century and what was going on is that 
the Russians were very adaptive, which is something I respect. Where the Russians, the English actually sailed around the north of Scandinavia to try to, their goal was to go all the way over Asia to trade with China. But they discovered, they, it's funny that the English rediscovered Russia. Western Europeans forgot Russia was there. So the English rediscovered Russia. And the Russians, upon seeing the English, discovering England as a country, immediately set up trading with the, Brit with the British. And they immediately established, uh, they're like, you're going to give us all your technology. We're going to trade you furs. We want to learn from you. And this is an admirable trait of the Russians. Um, and I, that was under the reign of Ivan the Terrible. And... Ivan the Terrible killed millions of people, and he did so by uh, trying to wipe out the nobility, uh, trying to wipe out the independent church. Uh, he literally killed uh, the, the patriarch of Moscow, which is, that would be like killing the Pope. Um, and so Ivan the Terrible, he built the new Russian state. He's called the Terrible for a reason, but with no Ivan the Terrible, as I said before, Russia is just Brazil. And... So the biggest thing he did was the conquest of Kazan, where Kazan is this uh, state uh, in the Volga, the Volga area. And this is like, you got Moscow, like say like, Russia is such a huge country, I have no idea how far it is. I'm gonna guess it's 200 miles from uh, Moscow to Kazan, but it's gonna end up being like 500. Um, so Kazan was this Muslim state and and uh, there's, I apologize for the digression here. Oh, it's it's 500 miles. Uh, I got that. I guessed it wrong, and then I, I. It's funny. I got the. I knew I got the answer wrong, and then I adjusted to what the real answer was. This is a brief digression in which Soviet cinema is mostly trash, but their battles are awesome. Because keep in mind, if you're in a society without a, uh, money or without a, a private economy, that means all filmmaking is funded by the government. And so Soviet films had insane budgets. And so uh, there was a, a Soviet filmmaker called Eisenstein uh, around the time of World War II under Stalin. And so he made movies about Russian history. And the thing that makes them worthwhile is the battles where, and these are all free online, like you could watch this today if you wanted, just look up Battle of Kazan, Ivan the Terrible, uh, Eisenstein, and what they did for those battles is they had Red Army regiments. Some of these battles had 30,000 men in them. Those Red Army guys dress them up in historical uniforms, and so for the, for the Siege of Kazan, they build up the walls of Kazan, they build up real walls, and they have real cannons blow them up in real time, and that's just what Soviet budgets were like. Uh, and then they had another one about Alexander Nevsky, who is he's earlier in the period we're talking about. He was a uh, the, he was the prince of the North Russian principality of Novgorod. He fought off the German crusaders in the 13th century. So with that, they got thousands of men to dress up in medieval uniforms and then had them fight over a frozen lake. And so when you wanted to blow up a wall, you had to actually blow up a wall because this was pre CGI. And so. Apologies for that digression, but it's so cool I had to say it. So Moscow conquers Kazan, and Kazan is their big rival. It's this Muslim Turkic state. Um, and and uh, so they Russia did a pretty good job of incorporating minorities, actually. Um, and which is something you don't really think about, but like in the amorphous oppressive blob, there is equality because you're all slaves to the czar. Um, and so Russia actually incorporated a lot of Finnish people because the, a lot of Siberia is inhabited by like Finnish peoples. Um, and so 20% of the Russian genome is Finnish due to that. And they incorporated a lot of Turkic and Siberian peoples into Russian culture. Um, the reputation goes that the Muslim peoples, like the Muslim minorities of Russia are the most beautiful women in the world. I, I can't attest to that. Um, but the Russians kept spreading east and the thing ivan the terrible did right is that he got down to the caspian sea and he conquered the volga delta and the volga is to the russians what the mississippi is to america and it's russia's internal river but it was in the area inhabited by the nomads and so russia started sending out settlers east and then over the next uh, like uh 
200 years or something, Russia colonizes everything from sea to shining sea, from the Baltic and the Black Sea to the Pacific. And this is a real strange process. And it's strange to watch because Russia, it can't move its Western border at all, where the Russians were constantly fighting against more technologically advanced Western countries who would consistently beat them. But at the same time, the Russians are just smashing across Asia. And they did this with the group called the Cossacks. And the Cossacks are one of my favorite people in history. And they were land pirates, where Russia was installing serfdom. And serfdom is a social structure where you are the property of your lord. And serfdom in West Europe is not serfdom in East Europe. And the irony is that as serfdom in West Europe, watch the medieval video, died out, serfdom in Eastern Europe grew up. Um, and because Eastern Europe used to be free and then it became serfs. And East European serfdom is vastly, it's much more comparable to Black American slavery than West European serfdom. Because West European serfdom is... Uh, you pay your landlord rent in exchange for protect for providing you government and for the property. And also, you're not allowed to leave your landlord. East European serfdom is, uh, is you can be, your family can be broken up. You can be sold. Um, you have literally no legal rights. You're not allowed to legally, uh, basically, your landlord can whip, rape, or kill you. And uh, you have no way to get back at that. And you hear horror stories where, for example, it was pretty common for the Russian nobility to keep harems of surf girls, um, basically use them as sex slaves. And for we have stories of a peasant or a serf accidentally making eye contact with a cruel noble woman, and then she sent him off to Siberia, which is a fate nearly as bad as death for just making eye contact for a second accidentally. And th this is just, you can, it, it's an evil system, and it was gradually constricting more and more of the population. And 80% of Russia's population were serfs. And it's crazy that there are countries in history where 80% of people are slaves, because serfdom in Russia is basically slavery, um, and people still work. Why are you working for this system where you're a slave? And it's remarkable. Uh, again, it's the same similar mindset for drafting someone for their whole lives. And so serfdom gradually got more and more constrictive over the course of the 17th century. And for example, there was one day a year when you were allowed to leave your lord and go to another lord. And they gradually shrunk the time window where you could, it was only for 15 minutes or an hour. And they said, no, you can never leave your lord. And that was part of the political compromise where uh, because Russia had a civil war and the end point of the civil war, which we'll explain, was to uh, let the nobility oppress the peasants. And and so. Basically, the Russian government cut a deal with the nobility. You can treat your peasants as slaves and in turn you serve us militarily. And with the creation of serfdom, you saw the rise of its antithesis, that being freedom. And people were running away from, from slavery, and so they would go out into the southern Ukrainian grassland. And Ukraine was frontier at this point. There's a, a one of the surprising, like best history books I've read is McNeil's. Europe's step frontier, 1500 to 1800. And it's a history of the Ukrainian and Romanian frontier against the Tatars. And it's one of the best uh, written histories. Um, and the Cossacks were democracies, which is weird, where the Cossacks were these runaway serfs. They fled out to, to Ukraine and out there, they established democrat democracies where they voted for leaders. They had legal freedoms. Um, and they were capitalist. And so they lived in these tribes and they spent their whole lives on horseback. Because out in the grassland, uh, in grassland cultures, you need to be on horseback because it's just, it, it, it's how you walk around. It's how you herd the animals. And so these Slavic peoples basically became like the Mongols. They ended up with a lifestyle like that. And the Cossacks were absolutely brutal fighters. And they conquered all of Siberia. And they did it 
partly to escape serfdom. And the irony is that the Russian Empire, an empire of slavery, was spread by freedom because the Cossacks kept pushing outwards in order to get away from the government, but they still liked Russia, so that it was still uh, Russian politically. And then the, the Russian government had a deal with the Cossacks for 200 years that you get to be free. You're not going to be serfs. And they made that deal because the Cossacks were stuck between either being loyal to the king of Poland or the Russians. And to get the Cossacks on board, they cut that deal with them. But then over time, the uh, Russians crushed the Cossacks and turned them all into serfs. And that's one of the saddest moments in history for me, that this free people was pushed into slavery. And... Over Russia, you see a lot of trajectories where Russia could have ended up like America. And I want to point that out where like the Cossacks were a democracy and Poland's nearby was a democracy, uh, but they didn't. And there are about five points in Russian history where they could have become like America and they explicitly chose not to, where they're defaulting back onto their worst behavior when they're stressed. And the, the colonization of Siberia, and again, this is an area that's ludicrously vast. I can't even convey how vast it is. It's 12 time zones. And that was done over the course of 50 years. It's absolutely ridiculous where the, the Russians went from the Urals, the border between Europe and Asia, out to China in the Pacific very rapidly. And it was done by Cossacks. And keep in mind, basically no one lived in Siberia. There were a handful of native tribes. The Cossacks would go out, rape, pillage, destroy the native tribes. Uh, and they did it for fur trading because Europe at that point desperately like needed furs. And um, due to that, the Europeans um, were willing to pay an insane price. And so that created the incentive for why these Russians went out into uh into deep into asia and the russians bumped up against the chinese and they had some skirmishes in the 1680s and the russia is the first country in chinese history that the chinese have said is legitimate and because in chinese political philosophy china is the only country that exists in the world everyone else is uh must submit to china because no other countries are real besides china Russia is the first country that China ever acknowledged was equal to China in political legitimacy. And the thing, though, is that Russia was Siberia. And Siberia is the Asian part of Russia, where three quarters of Russians live in Europe, one quarter live in Asia. And uh, Siberia is pretty irrelevant to Russian history. Because I've read Russian histories, and you could just completely ignore Siberia and have a pretty good narrative on Russian history. And it was unpopulated until the start of the 20th century. Uh, just barely anyone lived in Siberia. And the Russians would send convicts out to Siberia as a punishment. And Siberia has got a varied geography, uh, but it can, for all of Siberia, it can easily get to 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit in the winter. There's, there's a, the place with the most weather change, the most rapidly is Siberia. And there was a single day where this area of Siberia changed 70 degrees. It went from 20 degrees Fahrenheit to like 50 degrees, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit to like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So Siberia is a very inhospitable place, although the Russians haven't really used it productively, where if you look at the Russian side of the border, it's got 4 million people. The Chinese side of the border has got 200 million people. And what that signifies to me is the Chinese have, the Chinese just used the land a lot more because Russia provides no incentives for actually, because in Russia, the Russia, they never developed capitalism because if you work hard in Russia, that's just going to get stolen from you. There's no incentive for, to just push yourself because you're, you're, you're a slave to your landlord. And there's a weird part of the story where Russia colonized Alaska. And it's funny that the Spanish and the Russians Europeans went around the world to meet up outside San Francisco because the Russians colonized Alaska in the 18th century and they enslaved the native population. There were barely any Russians there. And then uh, they kept going down the West Coast. Do you know where Fort Ross is? Fort Ross is uh, it's a town outside San Francisco. 
and Fort Ross was a Russian fort. So the, the Russians had a fort outside San Francisco. And the reason the Spanish settled California is because they they wanted to block the Russians from taking the whole West Coast. And the Russian possessions in America were uh, completely irrelevant to them strategically. It, it's like a tangent to the tangent that is Siberia. But it is cool how far the Russians made it. it it's impressive that they uh, made it out to California. And the Russians also briefly had a fort in Eritrea, in Eritrea in Africa. That's one of those facts that you hear about uh, on like fun fact history channels. And you're like, how the hell did that happen? Um, so as of now, Russia has conquered Siberia and Siberia is populated by white Russian Slavs. And so the, there's a band of territory from uh, see the shining sea in russia which is ethnic russian and that made the russians demographically a huge group and their colonization of the new territories and over the course of 1500 until 1900 there went from 5 million russians to 100 million russians and for a frame of reference that's what happened to america too from 1750 until 1920 there went from 5 million americans to 100 million Americans. It, it's the power of frontiers. And Russia became the most populous country in Europe, which they could then use to smash into their opponents west of them. Because the goal for the Russians was always to grow inside Europe. The conquests in Siberia were very nice and very cool. But if you were to ask the Tsar what do you care the most about, it's reconquering Constantinople from the Turks. It's, um, it's taking the Baltic coast because Russia didn't have any uh, ports in Europe, where the area around St. Petersburg, that was a Swedish possession. Um, the area around the Black Sea was the Turks. And so Russia was this landlocked country. And because so much trade occurred through, um, so much trade occurred through water, the Russians really wanted to get a coastline so that they could, uh, they could talk to the rest of Europe because as of now they were blocked out and the Russians, they had a little coastline in the Arctic ocean, but I mean, the Arctic ocean is the Arctic ocean. It, you can't really trade there uh, or not on a significant scale. And for a lot of the rest of this video, it's going to be the Russians fighting Europeans and the first major external threat the Russians faced was they pushed down the Turks. And this is a strange historic event called the Time of Troubles. Because under Ivan the Terrible, Russia pushed outwards. But Ivan the Terrible is part of this very common historic archetype in which you often find with historic figures that they, um, they will spend and overdo things to, uh, basically to the detriment of their, their state. And so Ivan the Terrible pushed too far. He got slapped in the face and, um, and Russia fell in a civil war. And this is funny where you've got the false Dimitris and there were multiple candidates for the throne and they were jostling with each other. And people didn't know who the real candidate was. There was an impersonator. So an impersonator to the throne controlled the Russian throne. And in the middle of that, um, Poland, which was a big country, invaded Russia, tried to seize the Russian throne, and the Russian nobility supported Poland. And Poland nearly conquered Russia, and then the Russians pulled things back together, pushed back the Poles. And then Russia reintegrated under the Romanov dynasty. And the Romanovs ruled Russia from 1600 until 1900. And they, Russia didn't have a political crisis because the frontier with Ukraine and Siberia gave them so much space. And and so the Romanovs created stability, and then they kept pushing outwards. And so we have Peter the Great now. And Peter the Great was a historic figure who's the most important person in Russian history. And he modernized Russia. And it's funny, we're, we're, we're running low on time, and it, we, we still, the polit we've front-loaded the anthropology so hard. That we're going to rush through the history itself. But you guys understand Russia. You understand what was going on. And the, we, we got the culture down. Um, so Peter the Great, he 
tried really hard to westernize Russia. And so he went into a disguise and pretended to be a shipwright in the Netherlands, arms manufacturer around Europe, etc. And so he brought all these Western experts into Russia, and the Western experts in the German ethnic minority inside Russia had disproportionate power. So Imperial Russia was a country that was trying to colonize itself, because all these Western experts determined the culture. And the Russian nobility, they just became completely culturally unidentifiable to the people. Where the Russian nobility, they... Uh, spoke French, they ate French food, they became very advanced intellectually. You have Tolstoy, you have Dostoevsky, this was this tiny uh, westernized Russian elite on top of this giant medieval Slavic population. And that underlying resentment is what resulted in the Russian Revolution, because once you gave the peasants more power, it resulted in the... Uh, it resulted in them resentfully attacking the Western-dominated social order, which uh, resulted in the Bolshevik Revolution. Peter the Great modernized Russia. He killed millions of people. He solidified the authority of the state under—he under, uh, he made the state even more powerful, a continued theme. And he forced the Russian nobles to dress like Western Europeans. And Peter the Great is the most important leader in Russian history, partly for that— but he also fought off the Swedish invasion, where the Swedes invaded Russia, and they nearly conquered Russia. They were led under a brilliant uh, teenage commander, Charles XII. And Charles XII, under Sweden, Sweden was a military power, he knocked out uh, Poland, Lithuania, Denmark, and he conquered almost all of Eastern Europe. And Charles XII nearly just defeated uh Russia. And so Sweden would have been this great Eastern European empire. And then Peter the Great was able to modernize his military because Charles XII won at the Battle of Narva. And then Peter the Great took several years to modernize his military, and then he beat the Swedes. And once Russia beat the Swedes, they became a great European power. And so they were able to turn Poland-Lithuania into a puppet state, where Poland-Lithuania had a bizarre constitution where if one elector, if one basically, if one senator disliked a bill, he could veto it. And so the Russians would constantly have people veto all the bills so that Poland wouldn't do anything. And Poland became this puppet state of Russia that as Poland fell apart as a country, the Russians gradually consumed more and more of it. And they salami sliced Poland up into uh, over the course of a century until Poland was completely consumed by Russia, Austria and Prussia. And then this moved Russia pretty far west as a society, um, because Russia at this point, it had Poles, it had Ukrainians, it had Balts, and this meant that Russia was constantly dealing with West European culture. And the Russians oppressed all those peoples. Uh, they treated the Poles very badly. Um, but Poland also changed Russia. When Russia conquered Poland, there were more literate Polish speakers in the Russian Empire than literate Russian speakers. And so there was a brief period when Russia was considering taking Poland-Lithuania's democratic constitution and then um, making Russia into a parliamentary democracy. What happened then, though, was that Napoleon um, invaded Russia because Russia didn't like that Napoleon was conquering Europe and Russia agreed to trade with Britain. And we're in 1800 now where uh, Napoleon then decided to invade Russia. And this is one of the greatest disasters in military history where Napoleon, he, um, he launched an army of a million men into Russia, mixed army, French, German, Italian, Polish, and about, I think something like 10% of them made it back to Poland where the Russian winter slaughtered them. Napoleon won all the battles, but he lost the campaign. And, uh, and he just got completely fried by Russia. And this was the great moment that Kristen, christened Russia as a great power in that, they, um, in that they had defeated the French. And so Russian armies walked all the way into Paris. The Russians went, Russian armies got as far west as France. And so at this point, it was obvious to everyone that Russia would become a great country and that Russia was the great world power. And so this created a panic 
among the other West European countries that the Russian behemoth would conquer Europe because Russia had so many people, it, they were so disciplined, uh, they had so many children. And so Russia's big goal was the conquest of the Turks to reconquer the Orthodox peoples of the Balkans and their cousins who are Orthodox Christians and to take Constantinople, which was the center of their religion, and it would give them a port on the Mediterranean. And so the Russians kept on fighting the Turks, and they pushed the Turks gradually south, making the Balkans into independent countries, like uh, Romania, Bulgaria, etc. But this started wars with Britain and France, where you have the Crimean War, where Britain and France wanted to protect the Turks so the Russians wouldn't get too big. And so the British and the French invaded southern Ukraine, and... The Crimean War, not much that was accomplished. It was besieging various cities in southern Ukraine. But what happened is that Russia was so humiliated by the Crimean War that they had to completely change because Russia was incapable of supplying men inside their own country in the Crimean War. It was a complete shit show. The Russians couldn't... Uh, they completely failed because everyone thought Russia would dominate the rest of the world because they were so big. But what happened in Britain and France was the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution gave the British and the French the ability to massively punch above their weight versus the Russians. And so over the next 60 years, Russia completely changed as a country in an attempt to modernize due to the humiliation of Crimea. And so Russia, attempt, Russia over the next 30 years, it abolished serfdom uh, and the Russians showed genuine foresight in their leadership. And Russia would have had its own French Revolution in this time period if the Russian leadership wasn't so good. They abolished serfdom. They started to industrialize Russia as a country. Uh, they modernized the military. And they established Russia as a capitalist country. And that worked pretty well. Uh, and Russia, at the start of the 20th century, showed a lot of promise. It was an intellectual powerhouse. It was uh, industrializing. It was an one of the biggest agricultural powers in the world. Uh, everyone thought Russia would just keep growing as a country. And a lot of people think that the, that the communists modernized Russia. But what happened was that the czars, they let Russia grow up exponentially, industrially. And then the communists cut that off. And we don't have time to go into that. But if you want to know more, watch the communism video, where the communists just neutered Russia as a society. They just inflicted a tremendous amount of trauma onto it. And they killed, they did the worst thing possible, which was remove the uh, organic growth independent of the state. And, and the problem, though, is that Russia did all those things, but it was overpopulated. And so the average Russian at the start of World War I was very poor. They were dissatisfied. And you had these revolutionary associations across Russia. And these operated for a century, and Russia had a hyper-conservative period around 1800 as a reaction to Napoleon, where they cracked down on all these people. But you had these revolutionary associations that gradually built up more popularity as Russia got worse as a country. And so what happened with World War I, and watch the World War I video, is that the Russians lost the ability to... Um, the Russians lost the ability to fight an industrialized war because the Russians were so in the Russians were so incompetent and they were really at a crisis of leadership. And reading about the end of czarist Russia is one of those black pilling things I've seen in my life in that you'll hear stories where the Russians lost a war to the Japanese around the start of the 20th century. And that's the Russians were just completely incompetent. The Japanese won. And that was a huge political thing that a white country could lose to a, a yellow country. And you hear stories where, for example, the Chinese janitors who were Japanese spies in Ru Ch Russia's forts in the Far East in China, because the Russians were trying to colonize China, they could see the whole fort. Um, but And they could look at Russia's secret weapon installations, but the officers inside that fort couldn't. They were held down by regulations. So Russia was so, it was just such a stupid society and the elites were incompetent at that point. And if you look at World War I, the Russians weren't feeding their soldiers. They had horrible diseases. It was just untrained guys without even guns who were often charging enemy armies. 
And so it was just a complete clusterfuck. And World War I really demonstrated that the old czarist absolutist order had failed. And so that opened the door for communism. And communism took a lot of these threads from czarist Russia, the absolutist state, the fanatical religion. Uh, but communism really changed a lot. And so this is the story of czarist Russia. I, um, that's a lot to get into. I, I know we're getting into, uh, into time here. Um, yeah. For wrapping or should we close here? Yeah. Yeah. I'm down to wrap this. Um, so the best history of Russia is Orlando Figgs's history. I lost it though. I can't find it in my library. Um, so no, actually I lied. Orlando Figgs has got the second best one. The best one is this one by David Christian, the history of Russia, Central Asia, Mongolia. This is legitimately one of the best written histories ever. Um, so there's this, there's Orlando Figgs's history of Russia. There is, uh, Peter Turchin's war, peace and war that had, he's a Russian author. He has a lot of great stuff on Russia. Um, and then I'm going to throw in rise of the West by McNeil. This covers Russia really well. So that's Russia. Cool. Well, this is a great, uh, great place to, to wrap Roger as, as always a great episode. And until next time. Pleasure. Thank you.